Thanks, Professor Renner. Uh, it's a proud moment to invite uh, Dr. Vikas Menon, who is a professor of psychiatry at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Institute of uh, Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, Jipmer Pondicherry. It's a uh, institute of national importance. It's a premier institute in the country. Professor Vikas Menon uh, is primarily uh, primary area of interest is suicide prevention. Other than that, he is uh, working on uh, uh, research methodology in psychiatry and uh, psychiatry education, medical education. Uh, he is having more than 300 publications and uh, he is an active editorial board member of Indian Journal of Psychiatry, Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine, uh, is a reviewer of uh, many international and national journals. He has written several book chapters. He has more than 350 publications to his credit. He has edited a book on uh, Dhat syndrome and uh, written a lot of book chapters. So he will be talking on uh, prevention of suicide uh, in the context of South Asia. Uh, just to introduce uh, Good, uh, Dr. Vikas Menon is one of the leading figure in suicide research in India as well as in South Asia. So I invite Dr. Vikas Menon to have his presentation. Welcome Dr. Vikas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sujit, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Rayner, uh, and to the entire team behind this for the invitation you, given thank to you. me. Uh, for the invitation given to me. It's such a privilege to be here on this platform thank and interact you, with all of you. Uh, can I now have permission to share my screen, please? Yes, please. Um, but uh, it's saying that uh, it's not permitted. So I have sent a request. I think somebody has to approve it. Uh, Professor Rainer can. Uh, yeah, yeah, I approved yeah. it. It should be. Yeah. It should be coming in a second. Yes, yes. It is now. It is now approved. Okay. Uh, so uh, can someone confirm that the slides are visible in the full screen mode? Yeah, you can see them. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so, once again, thank you to the organizers for having me here. So, uh, when mm -hmm. I was asked to talk on um, the topic of suicide, so I thought I should uh, talk about something that is very regional, because this is a global psychiatry conference, but then uh, regional perspectives on on issues of uh, regional importance are very, uh, are very uh, significant for us to understand uh, you know, how each region of uh, the world differs with respect to significant public health issues. And uh, so we have done some work in this area, which I would like to share with all of you, challenges and opportunities for suicide prevention in Southeast Asia. Uh, so I will, over the next half an hour or so, I will uh, take you through the extent and magnitude of the problem that we are talking about in Southeast Asia region, that is where I, uh, you know, my country, India, come in, is, is, is located. And what are the challenges, uh, the unique challenges in suicide prevention in this region? Uh, what are the strengths and opportunities uh, that can be harnessed in order to surmount these challenges? And uh, finally, a look at some of the regional priorities for suicide prevention. And hopefully, uh, those who are listening will be able to compare and contrast with what is going on in their uh, region as well. And then we will conclude. So I have no conflicts of interest with regard to the contents of this presentation. Uh, I do serve as the co-coordinator for the Partnerships for Life initiative. I'll be talking a little bit about it later of the International Association of Suicide Prevention for the Southeast Asia region. Uh, so to give an, a brief background to the problem, uh, the red box you can see on my screen here is the Southeast Asia region. It is comprising 11 nations and it is a population dense area of the world. It has about, uh, it houses about 26%, a little over a quarter of the world, world lives in Southeast Asia. But then uh, it's suicide dense also. It uh, despite having a little over a quarter of the world's population, it contributes a little more than a third of world's suicide deaths. So uh, a disproportionately high suicide rate is there. 
At the same time, what complicates suicide prevention efforts in this region is the poor quality of data. So if you see this, uh, if this heat map here, so you can see that uh, Southeast Asia region, the data quality is not good uh, compared to some of the other regions like Europe and uh, America, where also the suicide rate is uh, higher than the global average, but then the data quality is better. And data, good data, good quality data, good quality timely data is critical to uh, suicide prevention and planning. Uh, and this is this are some statistics from India. So in India, the National Crime Records Bureau is the nodal agency for collection of suicide-related data and the only publicly available suicide data set in the region, in the country. So uh, we can see here that the suicide rate has been progressively increasing uh, even before COVID years, and currently it stands at 12.4 per lakh population, which translates to about, you know, uh, more than 1,70,000 suicides, which is actually uh, more than one-fifth of global suicides. If you check the WHO statistics, the suicide fact sheet, it says more than 700,000 people die by suicide every year, and a little over one-fifth of that, 20% of that uh, occurs in India. And there are no official statistics on attempted suicide in India as well as anywhere in the region in Southeast Asia. But it is estimated from our National Mental Health Survey, it is estimated that attempted suicides are about 15 to 20 times that of the official suicide rate. That is, for every suicide, there are 15 to 20 people who attempt suicide. So that's a huge burden there. The uh, This is a stacked bar chart. Uh, which shows the suicide decedents in 2022 by age and gender. I think two observations immediately uh, are very striking when we look at this uh, gender distribution and age distribution bar chart here. The first is that a lot of young people are dying by suicide. Uh, you add up those numbers that are shown in the blue and red parts of the bar chart in the red box, you get number of nearly 70,000. So nearly... 70,000 people below the age of 30 died by suicide in the year 2022. And the other thing that is striking is as you uh, as you go to below 30 years and below 18 years, the younger age groups, the proportion of women who are dying by suicide, that is the red part of the bar chart, you know, it is, it is increasing. And uh, it below 18 years, you can see that female suicides outnumber male suicides. These are in contrast to global trends where uh, males outnumber suicide, males outnumber females in suicide-related deaths. So what it means is basically not just that, you know, uh, a lot of people are taking their own life, but uh, people are dying very young also. In fact, the rates among young Indian men are twice the global average, but rates among young Indian women are nearly six times the global average. So what this means is that we need to look for the specific reasons which is driving this skewed gender ratio in suicides in this part of the globe and formulate uh, prevention strategies accordingly. So this, uh, these are some of the unique features of uh, suicide in Southeast Asian region. So uh, with that background, we'll have a specific look at the challenges in suicide prevention in the Southeast Asian region. I'll just list all the challenges first and then I'll come to, I'll explain uh, each of them in some detail. The first is lack of reliable suicide statistics. Most countries lack a national suicide prevention strategy. Uh, and, uh, you know, even countries where there are or listed, officially listed national suicide prevention strategy, there are many implementation gaps about which we'll talk about. And there are, there are high levels of stigma surrounding suicide coupled with low levels of awareness. So, Double jeopardy there. Lack of trained mental health professionals, human resource crunch, significantly hampering, uh, scaling up suicide prevention efforts. Imbalanced, insensitive, poorly regulated media portrayal of suicide and a relatively greater contribution of social and interpersonal factors in driving suicides as opposed to medical factors.
The first one is uh, we'll uh, discuss is lack of reliable suicide data, which as we saw in those heat maps, you know, the quality of data is not good. There are there are very few countries in the region with dedicated national suicide registries. And that, that means that there is lack of timely data, updated data that is coming in in order to uh, in order to inform suicide prevention strategies. Lack of uniform reporting or recording mechanism. So uh, in India, uh, and this is true for many other countries in the region, uh, whenever an unnatural death is reported to the police, the police files something called a first investigation report, an FIR, and the police investigates. And then they record the reason for death. Uh, according to what their investigation reveals. Now, here, there is no uniform decision rules. There is no uniform uh, procedure for investigation. There's a lot of statewide variations in the way unnatural uh, deaths are investigated, uh, inquired into, recorded. Uh, you know, for example, uh, families may not divulge the reason for uh, death of the individual uh, or they may not become. They may withhold some of the information uh, because of multiple reasons. Because because of the stigma, shame, and guilt that surrounds suicide, uh, and because of the misconception that you know suicide is still punishable uh, by the law and so on. So it basically uh, it actually the the reason that is recorded for death on the FIR boils down to what the constable who is investigating the case believes it to be. So uh, there is no oversight mechanism for that. So that leads to a lot of uh, significant underreporting of suicides for cultural reasons. And sometimes even, uh, for example, in suicides by poisoning, you know, it may not be immediately clear to the investigating officer whether the, uh, whether the poison was ingested by accident or by intention. So underreporting misclassification of suicides, misclassification of suicides as accidental death and so on, and uh, all may arise. Uh, you know, it's very common. And there is no data on attempted suicide, as we discussed earlier. So these are some of the key uh, limitations in terms of the suicide data that are available uh, in the region. The second one is no national suicide prevention strategy. So India... Sri Lanka, Thailand, Bhutan, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are the five countries in the region uh, who have officially listed their national suicide prevention strategies on the government websites. But then in these countries, uh, implementation is still suboptimal uh, in terms of the lack of community support for many of the uh, suicide prevention initiatives that are listed, lack of community support, lack of community participation, without which many of these initiatives uh, will not have the desired effect. Uh, there is multi-sectoral collaboration that is envisaged in many of these national strategies, but uh, the specifics of how that is going to be uh, actually implemented on the ground as such uh, many of the government departments and other public health departments work in silos without collaboration. So there is a lot of uh, deficits there in uh, multi-sectoral collaboration. And there is a significant deficits in the suicide surveillance mechanism. These are all some of the major pillars that are envisaged in uh, across uh, national suicide prevention strategies in the region. Uh, but these are the significant implementational challenges also. And to date... Uh, in none of the countries where the NSPS is listed, there has been a formal evaluation of the effectiveness of these uh, programs, unlike some of the other countries like Australia, where they have formally evaluated the effectiveness of these uh, national suicide prevention strategies. So these are some of the uh, challenges that remain. Stigma and awareness. So suicide continues to be stigmatized, an issue that is, uh, uh, you know, culturally uh, stigmatized in this part of the globe. And as I said, it can lead to significant underreporting because uh, family fears being isolated from the society or by uh, being punished by the law. Uh, and this is particularly common among female suicides because in India, when a, a newly married lady dies by suicide, it brings in the provisions of the Dowry Act and the husband and the in-laws 
may worry that they may, uh, you know, their uh, statements, uh, whatever are given to the police or investigating agency may attract penal provisions under this Dowry Act. And therefore, they are uh, they may withhold some critical information. Uh, also, uh, women tend to poison themselves more in terms of the preferred mode of suicide in India. And poisoning is a mode of uh, suicide that is prone to misclassification because it will not be immediately clear whether uh, the person who is ingesting the poison has done so accidentally or intentionally. Unlike, say, for yeah. example, a, a mode, a suicide mode like hanging, where uh, you know such uh, such gray areas are unlikely. So uh, all this uh, is a challenge. And all the suicide is decriminalized in many countries in the region. But for example, in India, data is still collected by the National Crime Records Bureau. It has not moved from the uh, crime uh, domain to the public health domain. Uh, so it is still uh, being collected by the National Crime Records Bureau. And even uh, with regard to the laws per se, it's only the uh, suicide attempt uh, which has been decriminalized, but still certain other factors like abetment of suicide and all are still punishable under the Indian law. So that all this leads to uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, confusions within the family and within the sources of information about how much they can uh, confidently divulge and so on, if at all they are informed about the latest legal developments in suicide. Imbalanced media portrayal of suicide is another significant uh, concern that is cross-cutting across nations in the region. Uh, several studies from individual nations and reviews across the region have shown that uh, the media portrayal of suicides is very explicit, imbalanced, and uh, you know suboptimal. Uh, specific, specifically, there is increased focus on harmful reporting practices, uh, such as, for example, reporting sociodemographic uh, details of the diseased which we know promotes identification with the diseased, especially for vulnerable readers. Uh, other, uh, you know, reporting violations such as uh, detailing the method of suicide in the suicide story, in the printed suicide story, which actually might provide a model to the vulnerable reader. And uh, uh, mentioning details about the suicide locations, uh, often illustrating them with uh, photographs, all of which uh, kind of attracts people to these suicide hotspots. So these are some of the examples of harmful reporting practices that are uh, that abound in the region. At the same time, there is decreased focus on educating the public when uh, reporting a suicide, for example, uh, including educative aspects about suicide, about suicide data, about the nearest suicide uh, help centers, about helplines or suicide hotlines, crisis lines. So there was less focus, uh, relatively less focus on these factors when reporting. And that's a significant opportunity missed to either educate the public or provide them, provide vulnerable readers who may be reading these stories and getting disturbed with the right kind of supportive uh, sources. And uh, research has also research from the region, regional research has also shown that this issue of uh, you know, explicit and imbalanced media portrayal of suicide is more pronounced when the suicide in question is that of a celebrity uh, or uh, another entertainment figure. So the uh, when the issue is more pronounced, then we know that the Werther effect is more pronounced when uh, it is a celebrity suicide. So these are some of the uh, challenges with respect to uh, the media portrayal of suicide in the region. And Media reporting of suicide is a very important population level suicide prevention strategy, which is why this is one strategy that uh, should be focused upon. And uh, if you see even the WHO Live Life Implementation Strategy, which was brought out in 2021, uh, one of the four pillars, evidence-based pillars of suicide prevention, they also advocate for is uh, responsible media reporting of suicide. Uh, but then very few... Uh, countries in the region have brought out official or national guidelines on media reporting uh, and, uh, you know, also show concordance with other international guidelines like the WHO reporting guidelines for suicide. So these are some of the significant gaps in this area as well. The final challenge I am going to talk about is uh, social, interpersonal 
and uh, economic determinants of suicide, which is which are major drivers of suicide in the region, as opposed to say medical factors. So some of these social determinants of suicide in the region include gender inequality, domestic violence, uh, which might increase, which might explain some of the increased uh, suicide suicide rates among women, particularly in the less than 30 year age bracket, because they may be experiencing domestic violence and, uh, uh, you know, inherently disadvantages social structures, uh, which are disadvantages for women in the region. Then uh, high rates of substance use, which might be contributing to high rates of youth suicides in the region, high rates of poverty or indebtedness, unemployment, uh, job insecurity. So these are some of the important uh, social uh, drivers of suicide in the region. I think why this is important to understand and appreciate is because it throws up significant challenges for suicide prevention. It means that for suicide prevention in the region, unlike in the West, where uh, you look at studies of psychological autopsy and it says that more than 90% of suicide decedents have mental illness. The corresponding figure in uh, in Southeast Asian region is about uh, a little less than 50%. Majority of the suicides in the Southeast Asian region do not happen as a result of mental illness, but as a result of some of these social determinants of suicide. So as, a, as an obvious implication for suicide prevention, what that means is probably in the West, mental health system strengthening, early detection, secondary prevention, you know, all those techniques would work well for suicide prevention, but not so much, not so robustly effective for suicide prevention in the Southeast Asian region, where you also need to look at uh, your macroeconomic policies uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, social support uh, policies and uh, mechanisms to strengthen these in order to also uh, impact suicide rates favorably. Now, uh, moving on from challenges to strengths and opportunities, it's not all doom and gloom in the region. There are some significant strengths and opportunities in the region that, uh, that can be harnessed to uh, surmount some of the challenges that we have discussed. The first uh, possible opportunity here is that most Southeast Asian uh, nations have a fairly robust primary healthcare network system that has been uh, running in a well-oiled fashion for many years. And uh, there are a, there is a vast pool of untrained healthcare workers. For example, in India, we have the Anganwadi workers. We have the ASHA accredited social health activists. Uh, we have the nurse midwives and so on. Uh, a vast pool of untrained healthcare workers who can whose services can be utilized for uh, task shifting or task sharing approaches with respect to mental health screening, uh, early intervention, and referral. So that is a significant opportunity that must be tapped into, and significant work is going on in this direction as well. Uh, one model which is uh, already successful in uh, one of the states in India is called Amma Manasa. It loosely translates to a mother's mind. Uh, what it, uh, what it, this program aims to do, this is basically a maternal uh, health program that is uh, for uh, tracking pregnant mothers and making sure that they have received all their uh, scheduled antenatal checkups, immunizations, and the iron and folic acid tablets and so on nutritional supplements. So uh, into that program, uh, the, care, the government of Kerala, what they did is they trained the uh, healthcare workers who were providing these screening facilities at the doorstep of uh, pregnant mothers. And they trained them in also screening for mental health symptoms, mental health distress, and providing psychological first aid and referring and putting in a place a referral pathway where if they screen and they find that the mother is significantly distressed, they could direct them to the appropriate uh, district mental health uh, psychiatrist uh, for uh, subsequent support and care. So this is a system that has been uh, written about. The references are there below the slide. So um, these are successful models that perhaps suicide prevention initiatives can piggyback on and uh, try to attain success rather than uh, reinventing the wheel by uh, starting uh, from scratch, you know, because then 
a significant funding also will be required to start suicide prevention programs from scratch. On the other hand, if uh, if uh, such initiatives ride piggyback on uh, certain existing, uh, successful, well-resourced, uh, well-oiled, well-accepted models by the public, uh, the Summer Manasa program has been in vogue for many years in Kerala and is, uh, has wide acceptance among the public. So, uh, if we can uh, if we can harness these models and integrate uh, suicide screening and prevention into such programs, then that may also be a resource effective model for uh, for low and middle income countries. So our group has written about it and uh, I thought uh, this is something interesting that we should also share here. Uh, I also want to talk about a couple of success stories uh, of suicide prevention in the region, uh, which can be adopted by other nations who are facing similar challenges for suicide prevention. The first is uh, Sri Lanka's uh, pesticide story. So Sri Lanka is one of the 11 Southeast Asian nations with a disproportionately high rate of pesticide-related suicides. And that is something very common to the Southeast Asian region, that there's a high rate of pesticide-related deaths, predominantly because uh, you know much of the economies in the region are driven by agriculture. So there is a fairly easy availability of pesticide especially the HHPs or highly hazardous pesticides. So uh, way back in 1980, uh, Sri Lanka decided to do something about it. And their uh, pesticide regulation policy had a staggering impact, about 70% reduction in annual suicide rates over a period of three decades. And uh, it's estimated that nearly one lakh lives have been saved over the last three decades due to these pesticide regulation policies. Uh, and the direct government cost of 43 US dollars per life saved. Uh, you know, these are the estimated cost savings as well. It's an internationally awarded uh, policy of uh, Sri Lanka, which has come into the international limelight. So something that is uh, well documented and uh, well recognized as well. So this, uh, this article... Uh, they actually show, you know, how the suicide prevention, uh, how the pesticide uh, uh, restriction legislations were implemented, not at one go, but implemented in waves, in multiple waves, starting from 1980 onwards. You can see the arrow marks on the screen. They represent the four waves of pesticide uh, legislations in Sri Lanka, starting from 1980 and up to 2010. So over a period of three decades, they implemented the uh, pesticide a series of pesticide laws that were driven by evidence and that's probably what led to its success you know so each time they implemented it before that they did a thorough study and found out what were the types of pesticides that were being used uh, how many of them were hhps and then how they could restrict this uh, access to pesticides and you can see with each of these uh, legislation waves there was a further uh, incremental drop in uh, suicides so uh, this, uh, this is a very uh, helpful model for other nations in the region who are also facing a similarly high burden of pesticide-related deaths and perhaps outside the region as well. Uh, the second success story that I want to share here is uh, from my own country, India. So the problem was that uh, high rate of student suicides, you know, India reported about 1,70,924 suicides in 2022, of which 7.6% were by students, and nearly uh, you know, 2,300 suicide deaths were attributed to exam failure. So uh, some of these non-governmental organizations which run helplines like Sneha in Chennai, that is run by Dr. Lakshmi Vijay Kumar and her team, they noticed that the helplines that they were running were flooded with calls during the months of April and May, which are the exam, the school exams, the school public exam season in India, April and May, they were flooded with calls around the time of the exams and subsequent uh, declaration of results. And they found many of these uh, distressed callers who were students, young students, school students, they were actually distressed because they failed one or two exams out of the uh, full set. And uh, they were actually contemplating taking their own life because they uh, with the failed one or two exams. So uh, then Dr. Lakshmi came up with the idea of suggesting to the Tamil Nadu government about introducing the supplementary exams. So 
uh, though for those uh, students who had failed their exams, they could, one or two papers, they could uh, write a supplementary exam maybe a month following the declaration of results. And if they were able to uh, clear the exams in the supplementary attempts, then they could uh, go along with the main uh, mainstream of their uh, the same batch, and they could uh, they will not lose an year basically. So the Tamil Nadu state government, which is where uh, this Neha NGO works, issued an order in two thousand three introducing supplementary exams, and uh, it had a significant impact on student suicides. Uh, it has been going on for last two decades, and over a period of two decades, nearly the suicide rate among students has decreased by 50%. Subsequently, following the, this initiative by the Tamil Nadu government, several other state governments in India also followed suit and issued similar uh, orders for introducing supplementary exams. So this is another significant success story in the region, particularly uh, with regard to youth suicides. So this is a table from the paper showing uh, how the suicide rate, uh, you know, totally about you can see the cursor on the screen, 407 uh, students died by suicide in Tamil Nadu in 2004. But uh, cut to 2022, you know, the that uh, number has reduced by more than two thirds. Uh, and uh, it has now, uh, you know, decreased to such a significant extent following this uh, successful step that was taken. A very simple, a very simple step uh, that only required some amount of uh, executive backing, but a significant impact in terms of reduction in suicide deaths. Right. Uh, in some in some of the other nations, like uh, some of the smaller nations, like Bhutan as well, uh, what they have interestingly done is they have integrated traditional and modern medicine approaches. Uh, so combining the two approaches have, uh, you know, led to better patient acceptability about, uh, about uh, help-seeking, uh, better service utilization, better user satisfaction. So this has been documented uh, in uh, the discussion that I have referenced below, as well as in one of the regional workshops that we conducted recently. So this is not something new that Bhutan has done, but it is going on uh, for more than two decades now. Traditional medicine units were attached to district hospitals in many of, in all uh, districts in the country. So this is another learning point for other countries in the region where uh, there are traditional systems of medicine that uh, are competing with uh, allopathic systems of medicine for uh, patient loyalty or client loyalty but uh, because of the uh, contrasting models uh, that uh, model of illness that these two uh, medicine systems have there's often a uh, conflict between the two but the challenge is how we can integrate these systems uh, because uh, it, it will help more people to come into the hospitals and seek help. I and mean, that's what ultimately we want them to do. Uh, you know, five countries, I mentioned that five countries have their national strategies in place. So it is a significant opportunity for other countries who do not have their national strategies to learn what how these countries have done, uh, you know, how these countries have prepared for their uh, national strategies, how they planned it out and how they actually uh, you know, put uh, wrote up these strategies. Uh, so here at this juncture, I want to talk about the uh, Partnerships for Life initiative, which is a flagship initiative, five-year initiative by the International Association of Suicide Prevention. The basic goal of the Partnerships for Life is to expedite suicide prevention through international collaboration. That's why it's called Partnerships for Life. In so uh, I am the co-coordinator from the Southeast Asian region. I work along with Dr. Lakshmi and uh, Dr. Anish. And in February 2024, earlier this year, we conducted our first regional workshop of uh, the uh, Southeast Asian region, Partnerships for Life Initiative in Goa. And the representatives from 10 out of 12 countries uh, in the region participated. I think we did not get representatives from Timor-Leste and the DPR Korea. But uh, the focus in the conference was on sharing of knowledge and fostering evidence-based interventions, how we can learn from each other's uh, suicide story or suicide prevention story. And uh, a significant amount of uh, material was, uh, in, was gained from these discussions. Uh, this was the group that where we met at, uh, at Goa. And uh, I am really proud to say that we are still very active uh, in the mailing group and the WhatsApp group. And uh, we continue to share our experiences and learn from each other. So it is not just a one-time event. It is 
in true spirit of uh, you know the the term or the initiative it's the partnerships for life and uh, this was the publication that we brought out from the discussions of the proceedings of the meeting uh, where much of the material that i have been talking about uh, for the last half an hour i have we have documented that in this in this publication which is uh, probably you know it is available for all of you to read yeah so uh, i will end with uh, a slide on priorities for suicide prevention in the southeast asian region so i think a major challenge here is to view suicide as a social issue rather than a medical issue unlike in the west you know as i said there are uh, in a, in a region where nearly 3/4 of the nations 9 out of 12 nations you know have uh, the poverty indices that are above the global average i think it's not a robust approach to entirely focus on the medical determinants but a lot of focus must also go towards uh, identifying and addressing uh, social factors that drive suicide and we must put in place mechanisms for uh, accurate collection of suicide data and probably the only way that this can be done in a cost effective manner is to integrate uh, collection of suicide data into routine healthcare systems so when you are inquiring into a person's general health at the same time you also include uh, uh, suicide related inquiries and data that's probably the most seamless way to collect uh, effective data so into routine uh, health checkups and health registrations uh, these kind of data must be incorporated uh, a lot of focus must be given to substance use as a driver of suicide particularly youth suicides Uh, in the region uh, which are uh, you know, there's a quite high burden of youth suicides uh, role of media and technology is something that must not be ignored because despite all the resource crunch in the region there is a very high relatively high penetration of media technology and smartphones so therein lies an opportunity for us to uh, to to intervene and intervene at scale because uh, technology offers you that opportunity and the last uh, i would like to say is uh you know there must also be focus on uh, implementation science because that's how we, that's the only way probably how we can bridge the translational gap in suicide research which is a big issue as well so uh, to conclude major challenges in the region are a lack of reliable suicide data no national suicide prevention strategy in many countries high levels of stigma and lack of trained mental health professionals imbalanced media portrayal of suicide and last but not the least Uh, a glut of social and interpersonal determinants of suicide strengths are the vast pool of untrained healthcare workers uh, the there are significant suicide related success stories in the region that other countries can learn about learn from and implement and uh, you know there are countries which run national dedicated hotlines for those who are distressed and uh, those countries which do not have such hotlines may also learn from each other which is what our pfl initiative seeks to do and the priority is to move from a clinical to a public health approach to suicide prevention and uh, i would like to leave you with this uh, image which is taken from the series of articles that the lancet public health recently published on suicide on the occasion of world suicide prevention day the special supplements that were brought out uh, where the authors also argue you know the theme about changing the narrative of suicide which was the theme for the wspd how we need to move from a clinical approach that lays more focus on indicated interventions for those who have a suicidal thoughts to a more of a public health approach where a lot of focus is also on universal and selective interventions uh you know focusing on a kind of a, a stepped care approach to suicide prevention uh thank you for a patient listening and uh, i'm happy to take questions thank you dr vikas menon for a wonderful presentation uh I invite questions from the audience. Either you can put your comments in the chat box, or you can uh, unmute yourself and directly ask the questions. Okay, can I ask um, myself? Um, thanks a lot. I think it's a very impressive talk. Um, I'm not really aware about some of these very cultural issues. Um, I think you talked about two issues, which were this uh, dowry issue and the legal changes or the legal implications. uh for dowry and um, giving information so that's one thing if you can clarify this for uh, someone who is not having that experience and the second thing is you showed some slide about uh, the increase of um the reduction of um 
suicide when Sri Lanka in, uh, implemented some uh, poison-related policies. However, when you looked at the slide, there was a, just a, an enormous increase before that um, in this uh, in this slide from the 60s to the 80s. Um, so is this an increase which was initially caused by the um, implement uh, by the uh, availability of poison, or was it something completely different? So is this so is this um, an, a specific effect of uh, so the previous increase is an, is this an effect of the availability of poison? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Rayner, for the question. So I'll take up the first question, which is related to dowry death. So in India. Uh, there are uh, there is a dowry law which states that uh, uh, a woman a married woman who dies within seven years of her marriage has to be investigated for uh, dowry related death. The dowry is basically a kind of a, uh, a you know uh, a corpus of money that is given by the family members of the woman to the uh, groom's family when a marriage is fixed in India. Uh, it is, uh, it, it is basically reflective of the inherent social inequality and uh, that is why many fam in many families in India, uh, a marriage of a woman is a financially very draining affair because they not only have to pay uh, a corpus amount to the groom's family, uh, they also have to bear the expenses of the wedding uh, and other uh, paraphernalia. So... Uh, Many of the uh, many of the uh, families, the grooms' families, particularly if they are not happy with the dowry amount that is released, that is uh, given by the bride's family, uh, they may harass the bride. Uh, they may uh, inflict uh, you know mental and physical harm on the bride. Uh, and uh, for, there were many cases of dowry-related uh, torture, dowry-related uh, harm, dowry-related deaths. Uh, uh, which led to the promulgation of the Dowry Act. So that's the background. So because of this act, uh, largely things have been, uh, you know, uh, under control in the sense uh, that there is some amount of law that is uh, now dealing with this issue. So the people are also afraid of the consequences. But uh, what it also means is that if in case an unnatural death happens in a newly married woman, it means that uh, because they fear that they may attract penal provisions under this law, especially in the case of a newly married woman, uh, the families of the groom uh, and the groom himself may be a uh, little bit uh, diffident to divulge the details. So that's the background. So that's about the dowry question. The second question is uh, in Sri Lanka, the pesticide related uh, deaths. So uh, while I am not an expert on Sri Lanka suicide uh, related deaths, uh, my understanding is that there was an agricultural boom from the 60s to the 80s, which coincided with a period of increased agricultural productivity. Uh, a part of it, which was driven by migration from uh, probably, you know, uh, organic, uh, uh, you know, organic uh, uh, fertilizers to more of pesticides and particularly highly hazardous pesticides. Uh, they used it to enhance their agricultural output. Uh, while it increased their agricultural output, the fallout was that now highly hazardous pesticides were more available to the uh, to the farmers and to the uh, those people who came into contact with these uh, chemicals. So then it provided an, uh, an easily accessible method of suicide. So that uh, was one of the contributors among probably others. And that is what made the government uh, sit and take cognizance of the increased uh, suicide rate, probably, before they enacted the series of pesticide-related uh, policies. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Joy. Yeah. Uh, there are two points which are raised uh, in this occasion. Uh, number one is uh, about dowry. And the second one about the availability of poison. Uh, with respect to dowry, I have a doubt. When a newly married uh, lady is uh, committing suicide, it is automatically treated as dowry, dowry problem. But most of the case, it is not the case. Not the uh, reason for that. Whatever may be the reason, it may be the personality disorder of that particular lady. But 
the society or the family for their uh, protection and they are treating it as a suicide and this case can be avoided not by uh, uh, not by law but only by a societal change what i mean is we have to take into consideration you know the division with respect to the property every member including the boy uh, boys and uh, and uh, girls or uh, ladies and gents they have an equal share so in the society we have to change to such a pattern rather than uh, asking and uh, giving this dowry and it, it it should be left to the parents whether uh, they are giving or not and the second aspect is related to the pesticides uh, in my opinion rather than the pesticides uh, more poisonous is the media especially the serials etc the films and the ser- uh, and uh, and uh, the media serials they are really showing the ways in which how we can commit suicide what are the methods and uh, how it could be so changes uh, should be done in this or must be taken in these fields thank you thank you dr jai i couldn't agree with you more uh, because uh, as i said there is poor regulation of media content with respect to suicide both the print media as well as the what you are referring to you know the visual media also uh, and uh, yes uh, the issue of dowry that you said you know precisely because the society has certain uh, fixed ideas that uh, when a newly married woman dies it is automatically due to dowry but it may be due to other reasons as you said but then that influences the reporting and classification of suicide in the official police records because in the police records what is culturally prevalent in that region you know they get influenced by that and then they misclassify and under report so it has a lot of uh, link with what you said and as you said you know there needs to be proper investigative rules mechanisms in place and some oversight mechanism to prevent uh, the problem is all this leads to fudgy suicide data which then impacts our uh, policy and planning so thank you for the insight yeah uh, thank you so much uh, dr vikas uh, yeah. now we'll be moving to our uh, next presentation uh, it's a wonderful presentation uh, over to uh, there is one more question before i go to the next presentation uh, how to deal with teenagers who frequently reach you your clinic with family members uh, this is a question asked by dr sekhar uh okay uh, you you want you want me to take up that question I, uh, what is the question sorry i just uh, related to suicide only how to deal with yeah. the teenager who frequently reach you your clinic with family members uh, have given up lis- uh, listening to the client and even the treating doctor due to repeated attempts uh i'm just trying to understand the question first how to deal with teenager who frequently reach you or your clinic and the family members have given up listening to the client okay and due to repeated attempts so i think uh, what the question means is that uh, both you know the family members have also kind of burnt out here uh, they have they are not listening to the client anymore uh, because it's a repeated attempt so maybe here you know yeah so there are repeated attempts but uh, so maybe this is a case where you have to do a full scale evaluation and as dr joy also said look at personality issues substance issues and other uh, social issues that may be there and then try to get the family members perspective also you know they are burnt out they are having uh, they might be having something to say about what they think is the reason for repeated attempts and then as a as a as a clinician probably my attempt will be to reconcile what the patient's version and the family members version and come to some kind of a shared understanding because at the bottom line is we cannot in in southeast asia particularly the family is deeply involved in care of uh, uh, suicidal clients mentally ill clients so we cannot alienate the family so the family needs to be uh, purchased into the support system so that is the challenge that we as clinicians need to think about uh- thank you so much dr vikas i hope uh, that answers the question of dr sekhar yadav uh, we'll move to 